The 2021 Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel was awarded to these three gentlemen. David Card for his empirical contributions to labour economics, as well as Joshua Angerist and Guido Imbens for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. Causal relationships, not casual relationships. Nerdy economists certainly aren't winning any awards for those, but these are perhaps even more interesting. The fact that this year's was a joint prize with two groups being recognised for their contributions to the field of economics goes to show just how consequential their work really has been. Labour economics is something that impacts all of us directly, but perhaps this has never been more apparent than right now in the midst of a global pandemic, with hundreds of countries all trying to put their economies back on track without causing greater issues down the road. So was this all just a coincidence? No, not really, no. In recent years, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has actually been specifically targeting academic work that has direct applications in modern economies. A great example of this was the winners that we explored last year, Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson, whose contributions to auction theory are actually being put to good use as we speak, linking the best buyers with sellers in some of the most complex transactions in the world. This focus on practical economic applications means that these awards are a whole lot more than some self-congratulatory academic pomp fest. They are genuinely an insight into new and creative ways that some of the greatest minds ever are changing the world around us. It also means that long-held economic opinions that most economists simply assume to be self-evident are being challenged. The work of this year's winners actually changed my mind on an economic function that I've spoken about pretty openly in a lot of my videos. So this will be a great chance to have some of the most brilliant economists in the world set the record straight for both you and I, but I'm getting ahead of myself. To truly appreciate the Nobel Prize and the contributions its recipients make, we need to as always understand a few specific things. So how does one actually qualify to win a Nobel Prize? What did this year's winners contribute to the field of economics to win their prize? And how are their academic advances actually being put to good use in the real world? This video is brought to you by Public.com, the internet's premier investing platform, one that helps you become a better investor. Public puts investors first. Unlike other commission-free trading apps, Public does not sell your trades to market makers or take commissions from payment for order flow, also known as PFOF. Public works for you, not trading firms. The app lets you see what market trends that your friends, co-workers, as well as industry thought leaders are following. You can also participate in live Q&A sessions called Town Halls with public company CEOs, allowing you to ask questions just like a Wall Street analyst. Get between $3 to $100 in free stock when you sign up at public.com slash ee and fund your account today. Just use your phone's camera app to scan the QR code on screen, or if you're watching on your phone, feel free to click the link in the video description below. The Nobel Prize was created by Alfred Nobel, a Swedish chemist and industrialist who was best known at the time for stabilising an incredibly reactive compound called nitroglycerine. By basically combining this chemical with clay, it became much easier to handle while still maintaining its explosive potential. What he had invented was dynamite. Literally. Now, in the interest of not being put on a watch list, that's all I'm going to say about that. Alfred Nobel immediately saw the destructive potential of his invention. Sure, it had industrial applications like mining and controlled demolitions, but let's be real, it was going to be used in war. This fact haunted the scientist, which is why upon his death in 1896 he bequeathed the vast majority of his assets to create a foundation which would award people who had made the greatest contributions to humanity in five distinct fields. Physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. Now, you might notice something's missing here. Maths, maybe, but they have the Fields Medal, which is basically the same thing, just a lot less prize money. But more specifically, there's no economics. Economics, as a separate academic discipline, wasn't really a thing until the mid-19th century. And even then, most people saw it as a combination of political science, business, and finance. It really wasn't until the Great Depression and the rise of people like Keynes and Friedman that economics became the topic of dinner table conversations around the world. Nevertheless, it still had the potential to do a lot of good. Being able to efficiently and effectively allocate resources has been instrumental in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of absolute poverty over just the last five decades. Obviously, I might be a little bit biased here, but advances in economic theory can do just as much good for humanity as advancements in all of these other fields. Now the Central Bank of Sweden thought so too. That's why in 1968 it partnered with the Nobel Foundation to create the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in honour of Alfred Nobel. The sixth Nobel Prize. 
Since then, it has been awarded every year around the same time as all of these other prizes are given out. The recipients are awarded the same solid gold medal and they share in the same prize money, although the economists have their cut provided by the Swedish Central Bank, not the Nobel Foundation. This prize money is no joke. This year's prize was 10 million Swedish krona, or about the equivalent of 1 million American dollars. Typically the people that win these awards are already quite wealthy in their own right. Certain more controversial recipients were worth tens of millions of dollars when receiving their awards, so the social expectation was that this prize money would get donated, which it has been more often than not. But of course, to some career academics, this is a life-changing amount of cash, and most people don't begrudge these individuals hanging on to the money for themselves. Now you might say, oh but Mr Economics Man, the real gift is being recognised as a Nobel Laureate. You can make much more money just by leveraging the notoriety that gives you, and you would be absolutely right, mostly. The reason that I mentioned the money at all is that the initial award criteria was that these prizes would be given to individuals or institutions that had had the greatest impact on their respective field in the year preceding the award. So if I wanted to win the Nobel Prize for 2022, I would need to publish my research before the end of 2021. While this system made sense in theory and it made for very exciting competition, the unfortunate reality is that academia is not like sport or the performing arts where a contribution's merit is immediately verifiable and appreciable. This caused some embarrassments with awards being given to people who really shouldn't have received it, like the Portuguese neurologist who won the award for his pioneering research in lobotomies, and Johannes Fibiger who won the award for discovering a parasite that apparently caused cancer. Of course, the peer review process later showed that these theories were completely unfounded, but by then the winners had already walked away with their honours and their prize money. It's because of this that the preceding year rule has mostly been abolished in favour of recognising contributions that have stood the test of time, and even more importantly, actually being used in practical applications outside of theoretical settings where disclaimers like ceteris paribus and ignore air friction can't save you. So this brings us along to this year's winners in the field of economics, who have exemplified this application over theory approach to generate some insights that could fundamentally change the way that we work. Labour is one of the factors of production, alongside land and capital. The theory is to make anything you need some combination of these three factors. They're not always equal, but you always need at least a little bit of each. Labour is the unique variable here because almost all of us have access to an equal amount of it by default. We are one person and we can do the work of one person, whereas one person can own a lot of land and a lot of capital while others own none. This has made labour, more commonly called jobs, a major factor in people's lives determining everything from where they live to who they vote for. Now despite its importance, most economists try to simplify labour's role in the economy as just another good or service. As such, they assume that there is a negative relationship between wages and employment. If you take a step back and think about it, this makes perfect sense. Wages are just the price that a business pays for a set quantity and quality of labour, and employment rates are a function of demand for that labour. Even people with the most elementary understanding of economics know that as the price of something increases, the demand for that good or service decreases, because less people are willing and able to pay the higher price for that item. This has led many to assume that raising minimum wages would do more harm than good because it would force employers to cut back on staffing in an attempt to maintain business profitability. By this logic, the reverse is also true. By reducing the minimum wage, it makes it cheaper for businesses to employ people, therefore they will employ more of them. Some infamous reports have actually called for establishing a zero dollar minimum wage because by this logic it would lead to zero unemployment. Even the laziest of staff members would be worth having around if the business only needed to pay them 15 cents an hour. Now despite the huge social problems this would cause, there is one other more immediate issue. It just doesn't work. Remember when I said at the beginning of the video that the Nobel Prize for Economics was increasingly being awarded to economists that emphasise practical applications and experimentations in their research? Well, this is how our first laureate won their prize. David Card is most famous for a paper he co-authored in 1994 which found no indication that the rise in minimum wage reduced employment. He did this by studying fast food workers at major chains in New Jersey after the state raised its minimum wage from $4.25 an hour to $5.05 .05 an hour in 1992. He then compared employment numbers in these restaurants to restaurants from the same chains just over the border in eastern Pennsylvania where the minimum wage had not been altered. 
If the traditional economic theory was correct, then employment levels in New Jersey should have fallen as they needed to cut hours to compensate for the increased cost of labour. In reality, the opposite happened. Employment in New Jersey actually increased relative to eastern Pennsylvania. It's important to note that the study didn't actually suggest that increasing the minimum wage would increase employment, it instead was trying to prove that the minimum wage had no impact on employment, so even no relative change would have been a positive outcome for this study. The paper itself also didn't actually set out to explain why this was happening, it was instead trying to show if there was or was not a relationship between these two variables. It did inspire follow-up research though that pointed to higher disposable incomes increasing aggregate demand in local areas. In general, employing people is expensive and difficult. Employers only do it if they absolutely need to. And if they absolutely need to employ someone because, let's say more people are eating out thanks to their new higher salaries, then, within reason, an extra dollar an hour in staff costs isn't going to be the make or break on that hiring decision. Card followed this paper up with a similar study on the labour supply side of this equation. He did this by studying the Mariel boat lift of 1980, which brought thousands of Cuban immigrants fleeing communism into the United States. See if you can answer this question. What happens to wages and unemployment when a city like Miami sees a 7% increase in its labour force, made up primarily of unskilled labourers mind you? A reasonable expectation would be that these excess workers would compete with existing workers or just not be able to find jobs at all, which would simultaneously increase unemployment and lower wages. But it didn't. Again, the paper itself didn't actually cover the why, it was more concerned about proving or rather disproving that this relationship actually existed. These papers, along with a series of other research papers published by Card and his peers, have had drastic impacts on the way that economists understand labour market dynamics. These real world studies are now having real world impacts on policy decisions. Now, these papers, as impressive as they might be, would not have been possible if it were not for the work of the other two winners of this year's prize. Joshua Angrist and Guido Wimbens, who both shared 50% of the prize, with the remaining 50% having been claimed by David Card. They all got their own gold medal though, so that's nice. These two won their award for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. In plain English, economists around the 1990s had a real problem of lying with statistics. They had gotten their hands on computers that were powerful enough to crunch huge data sets and were drawing relationships everywhere and anywhere. The problem with these relationships was that correlation doesn't equal causation. The famous example of this is that ice cream sales are highly correlated with drownings. Despite this correlation, ice cream does not drown people and people that have been drowned are not going to be hungry for ice cream. Rather, it is a third variable, a hot day, which causes both of these. On a hot day, people are more likely to go swimming and more likely to eat ice cream. This is an obvious example, but when it comes to economics, finding these hidden third factors can be extremely difficult, but it's not impossible. I actually got called out for my video exploring why cold countries are richer than hot countries because I concluded that this correlation was not spurious as it did not have some hidden third variable. A lot of people rightfully asked how I knew that given a hidden third variable would be, well, hidden. This is where instrumental variables estimation comes in. Which sounds really scary because it kind of is. I'm not going to lie to you on this one guys, this is an advanced statistical method which aims to find causality, not just correlation. But it's actually not too difficult to understand the theory behind it. The best example of this was one of Angra's early papers on the relationship between lifetime earnings and military service. Angrus wanted to find out if the experience of serving in the military caused lower lifetime earnings because of factors like PTSD or required injuries. The problem was that there were hidden variables that had a direct impact on both the independent and dependent variables in this study. Now, some of these could be controlled for. For example, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to join the military and are also more likely to have lower lifetime incomes. But that's not the fault of military service, that's just the inherent relationship between being born wealthy and living wealthy. The researchers knew this factor and could easily adjust for it. But what about variables that can't be controlled for? Someone that hates the idea of working a professional 9 to 5 job is also going to be more likely to join the military and also going to tend to have lower lifetime earnings. Again, this isn't the fault of the military, this is a personality trait that would have impacted their career earnings regardless of if they decided to join the military or not. 
The problem is that data pertaining to people's opinions on professional working environments is a lot harder to collect and therefore a lot harder to control for. Angra's solution to this was to use the data of conscripts from the Vietnam War. The theory was that since conscripts did not willingly volunteer to be part of the military, they would be devoid of the hidden variables that willing volunteers would have had which could impact both earnings and military service. This allowed Angrus to just look at how military service affected earnings and isolation, as in how much does military service cause a fall in income. The results were that conscripted veterans earned just over $400 a year less than their peers who were not conscripted. A pretty significant sum back in the 1970s. I only use this example because it is one of the easier ones to understand, but both Angrus and Imbens have had massive contributions towards the responsible use of data in economics. The practical applications of the research these three gentlemen have conducted over their careers cannot be overstated. It will continue to have very real impacts on the way that we formulate labour laws, deal with immigration and conduct research on these issues well into the future. So congratulations to them all and their fellow laureates who I'm sure have made equally consequential contributions towards their respective fields. This video was made possible by Public. In addition to being a commission-free brokerage, and a transparent one at that, Public's app makes investing fun and personalised through thematic investing. For instance, say you have an appetite for the plant-based food movement and you want to invest in this emerging industry but don't know the first place to start. Fear not. Just hover to the theme section in Public's app and with just a tap you can view a curated list of innovative companies that are making moves in the plant-based food industry. But you don't have to be a vegetarian to love Public's theme-based investing. You can also construct a portfolio consisting exclusively of companies in the artificial intelligence industry or perhaps the self-driving car industry. There are so many different investing themes to choose from. Check out the app for yourself and see what all the hype is about. And guys, the best part is, because you're a fan of the channel, you can get a free stock valued between $3 and $100 when you sign up at public.com slash ee and fund your account. All you gotta do is use your phone's camera app to scan the QR code that you see on screen, or if you're watching on your phone, just click the link in the video description below. Again, that's public.com slash ee. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.